Hello and welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes for the week ending October 23rd, 2020. This is Videocast 53, Podcast Episode 43. Welcome once again. So uh, we'll kick it off as we always do with a quick, uh, our two media spots this week in Reuters. Want to thank uh, Meta Singh and Shivani Kumarasan for including me both on Wednesday and Friday. Today's quote, uh, I said, the stimulus talks are continuing, so the market is happy about that, even though we probably won't get anything done before the election. And on Wednesday, it was the same story. There's no clarity whether even if they come to an agreement, it would get through the Senate with Senate Leader McConnell. So uh, more of the same. I think it's a slow walk for, for the time being, and we'll see what comes up after the election. Um, the other thing with the Supreme Court nominee uh, potentially being confirmed next week, uh, that may give President Trump a little more latitude to consider an executive order before the election. Um, that There hasn't been a lot of talk about that since um, a number of weeks ago, uh, Speaker Pelosi was talking about the 25th Amendment, i.e. removing a president from office. So I don't know if that was a veiled threat. If you move ahead with a an executive order, we would consider exploring that. Uh, I think with the full control of the Supreme Court, that, that would probably move on the back burner and enable us to get $300 billion out to the most needy people uh, immediately uh, and potentially before the election get the uh, direct deposits for low income out and PPP for small businesses, 300, 350 billion dollars. So, um, you know, that that is a long shot. They're, they're still talking on negotiations, but it seems the two major sticking points are, are going to have this thing uh, get done closer to uh, after the election. I would like to see uh, some money get out before the election and then negotiate a comprehensive package after the election, after the most immediate needs are met, that would include infrastructure. So we could actually get a long-term return on investment, not just continuing to throw money down the rabbit hole and have no long-term uh, investment uh, benefit from it. So uh, we'll see what happens, but that, uh, that does keep a lot of things in play. So we're moving on to our article of the week. This week it was the Taylor Swift, you need to calm down stock market and sentiment results. Everyone has been super anxious about the election, about the market after September. And, um, you know, I was out to eat with some friends in town uh, uh, over a week ago. And there was a gentleman at the table next to us. And I overheard him saying, you know, this market is crazy. It's a bubble. It's it's going to crash and it can't keep, keep going up. And I, and I think that is uh, a pretty common sentiment among many people out there including some professionals as well that um that it's, it's all going to come crashing down and we're going to go through some of the math behind it and talk about you know what the problem is what the solution has been and what that means moving forward uh, but, um, you know, with a six and eight year old daughter, the Taylor Swift, you need to calm down market, I thought was the appropriate theme for this week. And it's a fun song if you want to click on it. Um, but the time to buy insurance, and, and this is what I'm getting at, because there's been a lot of talk about, oh, you got to get hedged for the election. And, you know, what if everything crashes and contested election and earnings and uh, what about the, you know, COVID cases are spiking up, et cetera, and all these fears. And, you know, that's already reflected in the price of insurance. So this here is a chart of the VIX uh, volatility index. And as you can see, it's already, it's still meaningfully elevated above 20. It's actually uh, was at 28.65 when we wrote this article on Wednesday night. It's in that same range right now. And as you can see from history, when you, you have a market that the VIX spikes dramatically over 40 and then starts coming down, um, it's usually near the bottom of a secular, um, the beginning of a new secular bull market. It's not, um, you know, it, what people are doing here is looking in the rearview mirror and suffering from recency bias. 
thinking, in other words, you already had the plane crash in March and April, and everyone's looking back that the next shoe's going to drop, just like they were at the bottom waiting for the retest. And we said when everyone's looking for the retest, it doesn't come. And sure enough, we didn't retest, and we just kept plowing higher. And um, so when I was a younger analyst, I was at uh, an insurance sector conference at the New York Society of Securities Analysts, and they were talking about whether price hardening would ever come back to the sector as that there had not been a major catastrophe in some time and inflation was non existent And we're talking about insurance now because that's what hedging and that's what, um, um, you know, the volatility talks about. I view the volatility index as really a measure of insurance pricing. So when it's well above 20, it's costing you a lot to buy insurance on your portfolio or on the market. And when it's, you know, in the 10 to 15 range, uh, insurance is very inexpensive. And the win-lose situation for insurers is that in a catastrophic event, they have to pay out claims. That's the bad news. But the good news is that for the next handful of years plus, they can overcharge for premiums because of recency bias, the demand for insurance goes up and they can charge as much as they want because everyone's looking backward versus looking forward uh, when it's probably this, you know, the safest statistical time where you have lower propensity to have, have another event. There's obviously randomness involved, but um, so that's exactly what we've seen for the last six months, despite the market rallying, volatility has remained high which means option pricing has been expensive and those people looking to buy insurance with the VIX at 27 plus even if they do get a fender bender five or ten percent pullback which everyone's looking for um, their insurance probably won't pay because they paid so much in premium due to the high implied volatility or the pricing because it's priced based on a backward looking event that already happened that people are extrapolating forward with recency bias because it just happened they expect it to happen again and it just doesn't work like that uh, that even more likely they don't get the five or ten but if they do get the five or ten percent because they paid so much extra in premium because the demand was so high and the sellers were more than willing to meet that demand, the old saying when the ducks are quacking, feed them, uh, that uh, they wouldn't get paid because by the time you move down 5 or 10%, your, your time has eroded, uh, your theta, and, um, and, your, and your implied volatility was so expensive that you don't get, get the full benefits of that insurance. So what we talk about in this note is that if you wanted to predict a catastrophe, uh, so to speak, the best way to do it would not be when it just happened in the last six months. You, you know, you generally don't get two 30% corrections in a year, 35% corrections in a year. The best way to predict it, if you had to, <laughs> would be wait until the VIX hits an extreme low level. In other words, when no one wants insurance, and the VIX is trading down to 10. As you can see, that happened in 2007. And sure enough, in 2008, you got a major crash and recession. And it happened in 2018. And sure enough, uh, you got a major volatility began. And then we got the big crash a year later, just like uh, the end of 2007, you got the major crash a year later. So when you see that VIX get down to 10, that's probably your surest way to predict what the gentleman at the uh, table sitting next to us was saying that this market's crazy, it's a bubble, it's gonna crash, it can't keep going up. I would be more inclined to pay for insurance in a material way and or anticipate something material happening in the next 12 plus months in the in, at those times when the complacency was so high that no one wanted to buy insurance and it was cheaper than ever. Right now, uh, insurance is at its higher end of the spectrum and when you see it come come down off these spikes the market is already rallying and on to a new business cycle and that's where you get the biggest gains in the market so um, effectively 
what I'm trying to say here that the, the moral of the story is you get paid for buying the stock market or selling insurance when insurance is expensive. You get paid for buying insurance or shorting the market when insurance is cheap and no one wants it. So right now, as I said, insurance is expensive. Even if you if you bought insurance now and you did get your 5 or 10% correction, it's likely you wouldn't get paid anyway because the time would erode over the period and, and the implied volatility was too high. The other thing you need to keep in mind is that when everyone's buying the same insurance policy as they are right now, how do we know they're all buying it? Because it, because the implied volatility is high. Uh, the pricing couldn't be this high if there wasn't demand for it. So uh, effectively what the market is telling you when the pricing is so high and everyone's buying the same insurance is that no one has an edge. If everyone's doing the same thing, no one has the edge and sellers are happy to meet that fear-based demand. Um, so, so that's really what I wanted to get into with all of the potential risks, the election risk, the contested election, you know, tech, big tech is reporting earnings next week. That's going to be a big thing. Um, and, and, um, all of those factors coming into play and everyone anxious and everyone, you know, uncertain that's already priced in. So, and it, it's, it's known on the basis of the pricing and therefore it really, really won't help you in, in a tremendous way. Um, now, given that uncertainty, how can we have a reasonable level of confidence that the market's going to generally do better over the next 12 months moving forward, despite all of these unknowns, you know, what's the corporate tax rate going to be? What, who's going to be in power? Will, will the Republicans retain the Senate? Who will be the president? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anything can happen. But when we look at the math, the margin of safety is so material based on what's been done in the last six months to alleviate the ailment. So if you look at the uh, IMF's most recent fiscal monetary report, which came out in the last week or so, Globally, um, governments have committed 11.7 trillion, just under 12 trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus since March, the March and April crash. That's number one. In addition to that, call it round numbers, 12 trillion, central banks have buttressed this effort with an additional 7.5 trillion dollars of liquidity through purchases of corporate and government securities. Uh, and now we've got another $2 trillion on the table because the White House has come up. Uh, maybe the House has come down a little bit, but call it another $2 trillion. So you're talking, you know, 20 to $22 trillion of medicine. What is the magnitude of the ailment? Well, according to the IMF, the global economy will contract 4.4% this year. Now, they've been overly conservative on all of their estimates. As a matter of fact, at one point in... Um, June, they said that the U.S. was going to contract by 10%. Uh, we're only going to contract by a little less than 3 per, a little more than 3%. Maybe it's negative 3.5%. Maybe it's 3%. We'll see. Um, but if the global economy does as poorly as they think, and we finish out the year contracting 4.4%, on an $83.4 trillion global economy, GDP, a 4.4% contraction is about $3.66 trillion. So the ailment, the size of the ailment is $3.66 trillion. The amount of the medicine between global fiscal and monetary policy is between 22, potentially coming in at $22 trillion. So you've got over five times the medicine that you need to cure the ailment. The medicine, 20 to 22 trillion, the ailment, 3.6 trillion. And that's why we can be very confident in nominal terms that assets should generally trend upward in the next 12 to 18 months, despite having the bounce at the bottom, to which we're not even at new highs. We're at new highs, obviously, in the NASDAQ, uh, S&P hit it. But uh, for, for the Dow, we still have some, some ways to go. Given the size of this, uh, and yes, we'll have fits and starts, and we, we will have little pullbacks. But on balance, that amount of money, as the economy reopens, which um, uh, Marco Kalanovich from JP Morgan, which we're going to talk about later in this podcast, 
uh, made an important point about catalysts that are going to lead to the move into cyclicals and values right after the election. And one of them is that more states are going to reopen very, very quickly. And that's going to be huge. You couple that with the lagged effect. Monetary and fiscal policy generally work on a six to nine month lag. And most of the money's gone out within the last, you know, call it four or five months. And some of it's not even fully out yet. So uh, it hasn't even hit. And if you take the, the next six to nine month lag, and then we're going to talk about some some factors of uh, buybacks being at their lowest level since uh, the beginning of the last cycle in 2009. All of these things point to a very, very constructive year in 2021 for, for equities and, and assets overall. <laughs> and that's why the, the well-meaning gentleman at the table who probably missed the rally because he was backward looking and is desperately searching for an entry point, may never let it may never get his opportunity because the market has a tendency to not let people in um, when it makes its move and that certainly happened after march and april which we talked about uh, you can go back to our previous podcasts and video casts and uh, it may very well be happening right now uh, maybe a similar situation to 2016 on any weakness into the election uh, people lightening up into uncertainty may not get a chance in towards the end of the year but we'll see We'll see. We take it take it day by day and week by week. But the intermediate term outlook, we can have a little bit more visibility just doing the math on the amount of money that's been thrown at the problem and, and uh, it exceeding. It hasn't been this material fiscal and monetary policy combined since World War II. And we know the debt to GDP got up to 120 uh, percent. We're going to approach that uh, in the near term. But just a handful of later, years later, by the early 50s, it was down to uh, about 50, mid 50 percent debt to GDP. So it had come down from 120 percent down to the mid 50 percent. Why? Because of nominal GDP growth, nominal asset price increase. And we're going to have the exact same thing as a result of uh, five times the solution for one times the problem. And uh, and that's a good thing. You know, the 50s and 60s was the was a secular boom time in the United States. I think we're going to have a similar situation. Part of that was uh, driven by uh, demographics. And we have similar demographics right now with 85 million millennials starting housing formation, fleeing from the cities, a trend that began before COVID that's been dramatically accelerated since. So um, the next thing is, but, you know, isn't it a bubble? You know, on news media, we're constantly bombarded with some of the tech stocks that have really had monstrous runs, the stay at home stocks, the FANG, the, the you know, uh, big five stocks that make up 24 percent of the weight of the S&P 500. But if you take a step back and you look at the market as a whole, um, I put together, you know, a few, probably about a couple hundred stocks here that look nothing like a bubble. Uh, so if you're on the podcast, you can just go ahead to hedgefundtips.com, look under most popular articles, the picture of Taylor Swift, and just go through uh, hundreds of these. And, and they're all cyclicals. You know, you've got some energy, you've got some transports, you've got some uh, financials, you've got some biotech. Uh, you just have a lot of stocks that uh, you have some, some value tech like the Cisco's and now Intel just got smashed uh, that are... Um, really left behind so far, but um, are likely to start to outperform in the new cycle. And we're going to talk about why that happens. Uh, more energy here. Again, it's just dozens and dozens and dozens of these stocks that look nothing like a bubble. As a matter of fact, they look like they're, they've been building bases for six months and they look like they're getting ready to turn defense stocks, uh, Northrop, uh, you know, and, and, um, and it's all it's all teed up here. We're going to talk a little bit about energy and the Chinese buying lately uh, and the um, the floating storage dwindling and, and different things happening. More banks, more financials, more energy, uh, some leisure stocks, some um, food manufacturers, uh, Walgreens Boots Alliance. Uh, so there, there are quite a, a, a number of stocks, hundreds of stocks out there that are just the opposite of a bubble. They've actually been forming a solid base for the last six months. And as you see um, 
rates tick up, demand tick up, states reopening, these, these stocks are going to get tremendous amount of flows and we're going to see a more normalized breath in the market where um, they'll start to pick up some of the performance. And that, that compares to uh, what we have here is FANG, which when you look at these, and these are the ones that everyone focuses on. You say, oh, yeah, they do look like they're in a bubble. Maybe we are in a bubble. This is, you know, and look, it's 24% of the market. So you can make a case for that. We haven't had this divergence of um, weighting uh, S&P share of total market value by sector. So you can see how it's moved from 2000. Tech hasn't been this high since 2000 uh, relative to energy, relative to financials, relative to healthcare relative to all the other sectors and that's that's a rubber band that um you know many of the people that are fully vested in this say no it, this time it's different they have earnings and uh, they aren't reasonable valuations and i think that's i think that's true but i i'm going to spend some time back on the bill smead article that we covered last week uh i went through it again before recording this and he made a lot of nuanced points that i think are important you know, I've continued to say for the last couple of months that um, a company's never gone before Congress to talk about antitrust and things got better for them. It's just a matter of time. Now, for those owning the stocks, it's not really a big deal for you because like Standard Oil, uh, when it broke, when the government broke it up into a bunch of baby companies, um, you will receive a piece of all of that. So some people are saying, well, okay, I'll own Google. If they break it up, I'm going to own a piece of YouTube. I'm going to own a piece of Waymo. I'm going to own a piece of search. And the sum of the parts uh, is, is bigger than the whole. And to that, I say, I think you're right. And what you're going to find in that scenario is that the weighting are, is going to be dispersed. So new companies... The other thing that happens when you're in the midst of a an antitrust, which takes years, is that your growth slows because you take your eye off the ball. You get nervous about doing anything innovative. Uh, we talked about historically how Microsoft missed mobile because of they were entrenched in it. And the culture just changes. The, the energy of the company changes. It goes from offense to defense. And, in you know, it's very hard to produce new great things in defense. Um, furthermore, in the case of Amazon, hypothetically, if Amazon were to break up, which they can make a compelling case, um, and, and, and I, I give Bill Smead a lot of credit. Actually, I'm going to actually skip ahead it's just because I, I, I do want to cover this. Um, is that, you know, the AWS has financed the retail. Now, in the case of John D. Rockefeller with Standard Oil, he knew it was a monopoly and he did everything he could to cut prices to kill the competition. He called this cut to kill and then he'd buy out his crippled competitors. It's not terribly dissimilar to what Amazon has done uh, with its retail. The problem is, is Amazon cannot finance the cut to kill strategy with the retail side of the business if they don't have the profits from AWS. So if the government broke up Amazon and the retail, the sum of the parts may not be greater than the whole because the retail would be losing vast amounts of money on a standalone basis and probably wouldn't be able to provide the service at the price that they do, which would enable new entrants to enter like the Walmarts, like other competitors, brick and mortars that would up their online and delivery game and it would disperse the power, uh, but maintain the same value to the customer. It would just be de uh, delivered by different providers, as well as uh, AWS on a standalone basis would probably command a tremendous multiple uh, and shareholders would benefit from that. But again, it would disperse it from the weight of the index uh, and that would also, you know, give a lot of other companies uh, ability to participate and um, uh, benefit from the investable assets out there. So, um, you know, we see this, we've, we've covered it several times that the amount of waiting for these five companies. And I think that's really what's going to kill them because on a standalone, not kill them, but um, uh, take down their waiting. And for, for some of the companies, if you own, for instance, Facebook, if you own that and it's broken up into Facebook and Instagram, Instagram on a standalone basis may be worth a tremendous amount. So 
So when you see the antitrust and you see Google's stock price go up, that's why if you owned Waymo, YouTube, and Search in three different companies, the valuations would probably go up in aggregate and you'd probably benefit. So shareholders will do fine with the antitrust. It's just the um, as it's broken up in, in certain instances, it's going to really help the breadth of the overall indices moving forward. And you see these different phases that Bill Smead covered in his note uh, about different manias. Historically, there was a, a Disney mania in the 60s to the in the 50s to the late 60s. Then there was a gold mania in the 70s. There was Jap uh, Japanese banks in the 80s. If you remember they were, when they were buying up everything, Rockefeller Center, etc. Uh, then there was the Nasdaq 100 in the late 90s. Then there was the commodity and emerging market mania in the early 2000s. And now the FANG plus Microsoft uh, in the last 10 years. And um, I think that's that's potentially how it's going to play out. And he made a really compelling article. And then he talks about energy. They, they have the highest reserves per share in history. And he talks about Chevron and he talks about Continental. Um, and then he talks about housing in the context of federal, um, I'm sorry, uh, household debt service ratio is at its lowest in 40 years. The consumer's healthier than it's ever been. That's a very positive thing for housing formation. And then we see here a chart that he included from Bespoke, which shows energy and financials relative to technology is back at 2000 lows when you had that shift out, when you had the antitrust against Microsoft and money moved out of tech, uh, or at least on a relative basis and into cyclicals and namely energy, emerging markets, banks, finan financials, etc. And we're right at that level again. So, um, you know, the thing is, when you look at these charts, you say, wow, OK, it's going to happen. When's it going to happen? And, you know, the, these are six to 12 month, you know, bottoming processes. So processes. So, you know, we've been on six, seven, six, seven months of this process. And now we're starting to see some great things. And particularly this week, we're going to talk about the uh, yield curve and the 10 year starting to go and, and how banks are following that uh, that leadership. But uh, I did want to spend a little time on that. And uh, so when I showed the stocks, the dozens of stocks that are that are not looking like bubbles whatsoever, uh, these are the stocks that outperform in the early part of news cycles when GDP growth rates are their highest off of easier comps. And the catalysts that we've discussed covered in recent weeks are the vaccines. By the way, good news on that. Number one. President Trump was out today saying that they will have 100 million vaccines ready by the end of the year. Number two, both the Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca Oxford Biotechni um, trials that had been paused due to potential illnesses, etc. They were found to be not related to the vaccine. I think in one case it was the placebo group was the person who died. Uh, so they just restarted today, which is really good because they've been producing the vaccines in the background despite the pause in the study. So that's really good news. And then obviously we know Pfizer is going to apply for emergency approval in November already. So those are three things that have picked back up. In recent weeks, the market has hesitated when you know those studies were paused. Now they're back on track. And we had the uh, remdesivir from Gilead was finally approved yesterday for uh, to be used as a treatment explicitly for COVID, which is the first treatment explicitly approved by the FDA for COVID, which is just huge. Uh, analysts were out today talking about uh, putting $88 price targets on Gilead stock, which has just been moping around 60 for a number of months and now uh, potentially has liftoff. And I think the game changer for Gilead though is not just the approval because that's a great thing and that's gonna be extremely important until we get the full vac vaccine and we have enough people vaccinated, which will take some time. So that's the number one treatment. Uh, they also have in the background, the study going to see how remdesivir works as an inhaled product. So. You would get a nebulizer, 
you, you know, if you test positive for COVID, you get your script, you go to Walgreens, hopefully, you pick up your script and uh, you just take it like an asthma inhaler for three days versus having to go to the hospital and getting it infused. Um, and then, you know, you basically, the studies have shown that it brings down the duration of the symptoms from 13 days down to six days, I believe. And I think the Regeneron antibody cocktail that President Trump used, which is not yet fully approved, um, took it from 13 days down to five days. So um, we'll, we'll see how those study results come out. But it's really positive to see a treatment. And as I've been saying all along, I think the treatments are as important, if not more so, than the vaccines because <clears throat> it'll give people more confidence to go out. And, uh, and we're seeing it now, even with the case spikes in the Midwest as it migrates around the country, as we've seen from the Southwest, those came down. Now Europe is up, they'll come down. Uh, Midwest is up, that'll come down. Um, that people are still comfortable to go out their go about their business, wear their mask, but now with the death rate so low and treatments better and more knowledge, uh, it's the economy is able to to really function properly. Now, in line with the sector waiting and the dispersion of returns that we've seen in the last six months coming out of this. Um, what we see in the beginning of a new cycle and uh, is the value in cyclicals outperform and that's because they outperform when GDP growth is best and GDP growth is best when it's coming off of low comps with a lot of stimulus which which happens coming out of recessions. So what we did was we show what, what we're showing in these two charts here is the S&P 500 index cap weighted versus the S&P 500 equal weighted and this is a closer look to what it would be like if you didn't have five stocks that represented 25, 24% of the weighting. Uh, and as you can see, uh, for those saying that it's a bubble, if you look at the cap weighted, it looks like, yeah, it just keeps going up and up. If you look at the equal weighted, it's basically without those five stocks being overweight, the, the indices have been basically flat for three years. So up until that point, remember late 2017, when the VIX hit 10 and volatility picked up, the market on an equal weighted basis has basically been flat. Okay. And so that's what it would look like uh, if you broke up the big five or, or four of them or three of them into mini companies like they did with Standard Oil. And the other point that they made in the article about the Standard Oil thing was the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 had nothing to do with end consumer prices. Sherman recognized that the popular mind is agitated with problems that may disturb the social order, and among them, none is more threatening than the concentration of capital into vast combinations. So um, there may be more to it than just saying, if you're Google, well, there's Bing, you know, people compete, compete against us. Uh, it may get down to more of what they were thinking about in the Sherman Antitrust Act, which didn't relate to prices, because if you remember, Rockefeller was cutting to kill and prices were coming lower, but he was putting all the competition out of business and aggregating it and having this vast concentration of capital. So that may be more of the argument moving forward that you see with some of these bigger tech companies. This is going to be a long process, but the growth rates, number one, they've pulled forward a tremendous amount of growth this year. If you look at S&P 500 earnings, uh, Infotech is going to grow at half the pace of the S&P next year, about 13% earnings growth relative to 26%. And that's excluding any implications of antitrust and dealing with the, the headaches of having to go before Congress and, and do that dance every few months that Congress wants to call them in until um, there starts to get teeth to it. So, um, so, so that's... That's a key part of the argument. Next, um, the yield curve continues to steepen. I want to show you the 10-year yield relative to the XLF in the last month. Uh, the red and green line here is the 10-year yield. It was at 64 basis points. It now got up to 86 basis points this week and closed up at 84 basis points. And if you look at what happened to the XLF since, we've had a big move this, this month. As a matter of fact, the KBE, the regional bank index, is up 
18%. Where is that? Yeah, 18% in October, on track for the best month since November 2016. So we've been one of the lonely voices pounding the table on banks. And you can go back to the last probably 8 to 10 <laughs> video casts that we've been doing it. But um, you can see here, this was the month in August of 2019 where the yield curve inverted uh, and predicted the recession, which we saw in... Um, early 2020, the first two quarters, we had negative GDP growth. We're going to have a monster uh, GDP growth this quarter. And this is what happened to the 210 spread. It went from the inverted to its highest level now since... Um, widest in more than two years, the spread between the 2 and 10. And we've been covering a ton of that with the... Um, with this chart here that we continue to show every couple of weeks that uh, you invert and then you get the crash, you invert and then you get the crash, you invert, then you get the crash. And then as this spikes up, the 210 spread, then financials start to take off for secular bull markets, secular bull markets. And that's what's happening right now. And that's how we're positioned. And we, we did add uh, some more banks this week. Um, and, uh, and particularly some of the money center that lag behind and our favorite, of course, is Wells Fargo, which we're going to talk about uh, in just a little bit. So um, the other thing is, uh, so banks are just getting started. And I made a point about energy. And I said, either someone has just cracked nuclear fusion or energy is a generational buy at these levels as well. Uh, Bill Smead made the same point in his article. Um, and about reserves per share. So my point was that the global population, and we, we kind of missed the point a lot of times in the developed world, uh, because the po global population and the middle class in emerging markets is still growing at a much faster pace than renewable alternatives. The time to buy is when no one wants them. That's the case with banks and energy, uh, which we've been loading the boat, and will continue to do so selectively and methodically in the highest quality names and that's been our strategy and now now that it's turning we're starting to uh, see that happen now if you take nothing else from this week's note the most important point was expect a moderation of waiting and a rotation in leadership in the s p 500 over the next 12 to 18 months that doesn't mean because banks and energy are going to do well that fang is going to crash I, I i i the basis of the argument has always been relative outperformance for cyclicals and value in the early part of the cycle that doesn't mean it's explicitly at the expense of other sectors it just means they should do slightly better if not materially better uh, but that does not mean that other sectors won't go up as well because as i said you've got 22 tr trillion dollars of solution for a 3.6 trillion dollar problem so um, on balance, most assets should do better over the next 12 to 18 months. And we're start, we're going to see it more also in commodities and probably emerging markets as well. Um, there was a funny article, not, not a funny article, there, the, the quote of Baron Rothschild, the time to buy is when there's blood in the streets. Um, he made a fortune buying um, in the panic that followed the Battle of Waterloo against Napoleon. But that's not the whole story. This was from Investopedia. The original quote is actually believed to be, buy when there's blood in the streets, even if the blood is your own. <laughs> so, you know, one of our positions is Wells Fargo. And, you know, we've been adding to that for a number of months. It's absolutely gone nowhere. It's literally been going sideways for three or four months plus. And um, so you just selectively lean into it over time because when it turns, they turn aggressively and they turn hard. So, you know, on the one hand, uh, it's fine. It goes sideways. On the other hand, there, it's blood because you could have used the, the capital, that slot of your portfolio for other things. But when they play catch up, they catch up very, very quickly. And I think we're going to see that type of catalyst very shortly in, in many of the banks and, and some of them are already moving hard and the, the laggards will, will turn aggressively as well. Um, and we're seeing that follow the 10 year yield. As a matter of fact, in I think it was August when it hit the 10 year hit uh, 
I don't know if it got into 50 basis points. I said I said I'd be it would be more likely to see the 10 year over 100 basis points by the end of the year than at 30 basis points. A lot of people were calling for 30 basis points by the end of the year, and um, and that was that was the capitulation is really what it comes down to. Um, okay, the second thing is uh, when we talk about this flip. Um, Brutus so eloquently said to Cassius and Julius Caesar, there's a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. So most people hear this and they say, wow, Shakespeare, now's the time, carpe diem, seize the day. But what, what many people don't know is that it didn't wind up well for Brutus. So Brutus got it right that it was time, he convinced Cassius that it was time to begin the battle against Octavius and Anthony. Uh, and, but while they won the initial battle, he, Brutus then began to celebrate too early and that gave, gave them time to regroup and ultimately he lost. And that's one thing that we need to keep in mind moving forward with, with things like, uh, the cyclicals. If you look at the outperformance, it all comes in the first eight quarters of the new cycle. So just as you get the 100% plus rallies off the bottom, and then you start to see a monster interest, you know, six to eight quarters down when everyone's buying them and say, oh, they're breaking out to new highs. Now's the time to buy banks. Now's the time to buy energy. It's at all time highs or, or you know, different stocks. Uh, that's when you don't want to be like Brutus and say, oh, you know, we'll press it. Everyone's starting to buy now. Um, that's actually when we'll want to ring the register and, and move on because that's probably when a newer cycle in tech is going to be starting to begin again as growth in the GDP slows down after growing at what could be 6% next year and, and as much or more maybe in 2022. After that, um, let's not you know be overly aggressive, take massive profits off the table and then start to look at others, and, and uh, otherwise we wind up like Brutus. So <laughs> lessons to learn from Shakespeare this week. Uh, this is the time, I believe, uh, taken at the flood leads on to fortune. I think there's huge opportunity here in this rotation into val value and cyclicals for financials, for some pockets of energy, and um, defense stocks, and uh, home builders. We've already had a huge run, but th that's going to continue. Um and that's how we think about it. As far as the short-term market sentiment indicators, they're all moving up near two extremes. So we hit 35.75 in the AAII. Usually over 40% is where you want to get worried. Um, the fear and greed was at 63. You know, over 80 is where you want to get worried. And the active managers got chased up again to 100% after being their highest net short in tech um, in September. So uh, that we keep an eye on. And as I've said for four weeks, we don't bet, don't bet against science. A uh, couple things to deal with. We got big tech reporting this week. We have the continued slow walk on the stimulus package. I don't expect any miracles on that before the election. The surprise would be if they get the Supreme Court confirmation, then maybe they go ahead with the executive order. Uh, but um, you know, more likely it's just going to drag through the election. People will just spend the next week focused on, on the election outcome. And um, keep in mind that if we do get the expected volatility that's already priced into the insurance, uh, it's likely the trampoline will be put out to ensure that none of the buyers of the premium are paid out. That's just the way it always works. Maybe a fender bender, but no total losses in the cards. And the opposite is true. We may finally see the VIX normalize below 20 before the end of the year. And that's when it may make more sense to explore buying insurance, not when everyone wants it right now. So if we see the VIX maybe drop below 15 towards the end of the year in January, then maybe you buy a little insurance into February when there's seasonal weakness if, if the VIX is indicating that complacency is set in. Uh, but it's certainly not the case right now with VIX at, at whatever it is, 27, 28. Um, okay, here's the update on the Wells Fargo long-term chart. It did peak below last week. Fortunately, it came back this week. So it's uh, it was up 2% this week. Wells Fargo still holding this long-term volume by price. 
uh, still, you know, <laughs> break out back test for, for those and still here on this ADX crossover, it's worked 15 out of the 16 times that it's crossed. It went on to rally. So we're waiting for an inflection here and the, the yield curve may have been the ticket. This is our Cobra Kai short term chart on the Wells Fargo. Uh, <laughs> we did the leg sweep and then rallied and now we swept the leg sweep leg, but we've held the lows from uh, May and we've we've started to turn up, as I said, up to to just over 2% this week. So I'd like to get above this line and then uh, hopefully go for a big move when no one expects it and get a lot of short covering and, and a lot of buying. The other story that was out was that the reason Buffett has been a seller, other than maybe it's the new lieutenants, and it's not that he's against banks per se, because he's been buying Wells, uh, he's been buying Bank of America. And by the way, um, his number two, Charlie Munger, Wells Fargo is still 40% of Charlie Munger's insurance portfolio. He has, he's got like five stocks. Wells Fargo is the number one holding at 40% of the portfolio. Number two is Bank of America, I think at 30% uh, and then USB and PNC. I haven't looked at it in a couple of weeks, but um, he, he hasn't sold a share of Wells Fargo as far as I know. Now, uh, there are two theses as to why Buffett sold at the bottom with stock down 50%. Uh, one was that he was angry at that the board did not listen to him. He had asked them not to hire a CEO from Wall Street. He wanted someone uh, from outside the industry and they did not listen. So um, he just started selling stock from that moment. And the second thing that people will say, which we've covered in recent weeks, is perhaps related to his legacy. He can uh, say that, you know, as I learned that they had done unethical practices, you know, we reduced our position in the stock uh, because Solomon almost destroyed his reputation in the 90s. And um, he kind of made a pact uh, at the first sign of, any improprietary, improprietary, impropriety moving forward, he would, um, you know, not be involved. Don't lose a shred of reputation. So this may be a legacy play as well. But um, but those were two viable explanations as to why he's generally not bearish on banks. He likes the lenders. He likes the mortgage business, etc. As a matter of fact, his uh, great uh, grand nephew. Alex Rosick, who I know, who was an investor in a company when I was a CEO of a public company, uh, he just did a SPAC to do something in housing, uh, mortgage related, and the whole trend with uh, secular move with the millennials that we've covered many times on the um, on the podcast. So, um, so he'll do really well with that. Now, let's go to the Ask Me Anything question of the week. Uh, this is from Sheldon first time caller. <laughs> uh, he says, okay, he's related to, he's talking about a trade in our uh, trade service hedge fund trade tips for people with smaller accounts that, uh, that are not um, investment management clients with Great Hill Capital. And he says, my experience is that option spreads are large. Uh, he talks about a specific uh, trade and he says, uh, bottom line is that the market maker, maker has great latitude for making trade to maximize his profit. Uh, how do you set your price limits at the midpoint bid ask to avoid chasing? I assume the market maker uses Black Shoals to set the ask prices. Then he set the bid price, thereby establishes the large spread question mark. Um, ba -ba -ba, how? Can you improve your limit orders be executed? Okay, so he's talking about in the money call spreads and put spreads that we do, debit spreads uh, for the hedge fund trade tips trade service. And uh, the best way, number one is you can spend a tremendous amount of time on option pricing, but at the end of the day, they're either going to hit your limit or they're not. And um, you don't need to take every single trade. So I'll generally set a limit at the mid and I'm setting it at that price uh, because based on my analysis of, of the stock, the underlying conditions, etc., I'm willing to pay that price based on the expected val expected return uh, and, and in that case they're sh shorter term over the next few months. Um, so 
there, there's two ways. Number one is you like the trade and you just hit, take the mid. If you get hit in 24 hours, take the trade. If not, take a pass on the trade. Or you can go, you know, 10 cents over the mid if it's $5 wide or 20 cents if it's $10 wide. And either you get hit or you don't. You know, that that's it. You don't have to be too eager to do every trade. If you're on the podcast, go to hedgefundtips.com. Catch the last uh, 10 minutes on the video cast. And um, uh, if we get cut off, I think we're going to get it done in time. But if not, you can watch the last six, uh, last uh, number of minutes on the video cast. Or you can go to... This is from the uh, OIC. This is, let me just get this website here. Uh, okay, it's um, the Options Investment Council. You can go to their website. I think it's oic.ivolatility.com or just Google Options Calculator. And um, so let's just see, for instance, you could take a stock like and you can see let's say you are uh, um, bullish on Gilead okay so you type it in here so we're going to look at historical and implied volatility and you can see that um, the historic volatility has really come down it was elevated in March so that's not a time when you want to buy a lot of premium that's a time when you want to be selling premium and it's now come back and has reverted to its long-term 30-day historic volatility implied vol volatility is a, a bit higher so it's trading a little expensive lately maybe there was something known about this approval coming in uh, and then you have to make a decision now when you're doing spreads you'll kind of get offset so even if implied volatility is too high what you're, you'll capture a good portion of the high implied volatility in the, in the leg that you're selling uh, versus the overpayment that you're doing in the leg that you're buying. And that's why I say if it's in the money and you like the mid, just put the limit or a little higher than, than the mid and, um, and you should get hit. But if you're buying like straight options and you see a situation where the implied volatility is at 80%, even if you're right directionally, the odds of you making money are so small that you can just pass and this is something that you you can do the other thing is if you go to this um site they also have an options calculator so once you say okay the uh implied volatility is in line with historic norms it's not aberrational so i'm not going to be dramatically overpaying relative to history then you can put in the stock and you know it, chevron and you can say, you know, pick your strike, pick your date, and this will plug in um, the implied volatility. You can play around with the implied volatility. You could say, oh, I'm not willing to pay 39% implied volatility. I'm going to move it down to its historic mean of 30%. And rather than the call option being whatever it was, a buck 80, it goes down to a buck 40 and say, I'm not willing to pay that. And you just stick your limit in for there. And you'd have to, in the case of a call spread or put spread, you'd have to do it for both legs and say, this is the perfect price I'm willing to pay. But the problem is, is that life doesn't work that way. So the market's going to give you a mid and you either take it at the mid or the market gives it to you at the mid or you move on. I mean, there's there's a new trade to do every single day. So I uh, these are the ways you can calculate every leg and or if you're just doing a long call or a long put because you have a directional bias, just make sure you're buying when no one's interested and when implied volatility is low. So if you're directionally correct, that you will get paid materially for uh, making that bet. And that's that's how I would think about it. Uh, your question was very detailed. My answer was very simple, but it's going to give you what you need to make uh, an informed decision. And that's kind of how I think about it. But most of the time, because I'm selling the offsetting leg of, of an in-the-money option, I will be less sensitive to what the implied volatility is because what I'm giving up on the buy side, I'm making up on the sell side. Uh, all I need to do is for the thesis, all I need is for the thesis to be correct for it to make money and not get punished by a long-only call or put where I'm much more sensitive about how is it trading relative to its underlying historic and implied volatility? And do I want to pay that much uh, for the risk? And I hope that answers your question. 
Okay, so this is going to be the whole story with banks. You saw the 10-year note start to come in a little bit. We'll see. Sometimes these topping processes take a while, but I think the, the, the direction is correct, and that's helping banks in the short term. Uh, we covered the uh, Pfizer uh, emergency approval. Uh, we talked about the Gilead approval, and now uh, obviously the Lilly and the Regeneron. Hopefully we'll get uh, treatment approval in coming. It may, may take a bit longer for them because <laughs> they're so new, but at least emergency authorization and availability is the key. Um, and the analyst on uh, Gilead following the approval. Okay, SVB Lyric analyst Jeffrey Porges has high hopes. Uh, they're going to call remdesivir Vel Vecclori, which makes no sense because everyone knows it as remdesivir. Uh, high hopes for Vecclori revenues and cites the product as a key reason for his outperform rating on Gilead stock, which he thinks can reach $88. It's trading at, it was 60 it's I think $63 at the close. Uh, national governments may stockpile the drug against future outbreaks, he says. So that would be a very positive thing um, for a stock that was left for dead. Uh, we covered the Bill Smead. Um, and then this group that I've covered once or twice before in the past, HFIR, does some good research on oil demand. And they're talking about the dwindling floating storage as a sign um, of... Um, so let's see, physical spreads, market sentiment is bearish. This is all related to oil. And he kind of shows how the recent Chinese crude buying is going to offset the increase of production from Libya. Also, Russia was out this week saying that they might extend the cuts. If you remember, the plan, the 7.7 .7 million barrels a day cuts goes to January. Then it drops down to 5.7 until April of 20. 22 so for another year and a quarter uh, they're talking now about maybe keeping it at the 7.7 .7 level in the short term which would be really uh constructive for the sector as well this is china's floating storage that they were pointing out as a signal uh china's crude buying is already picking up seeing more ships going to china this month versus september and this should increase material in november as the floating storage backlog is gone by then so uh, they've been pretty good on their calls. They tend to be very bullish, you know, to uh, a guy with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You know, don't ask your barber if you need a haircut, as Buffett would say. These are energy guys. So uh, so they're always looking at that side of the story. But um, the data supports it, and that was a constructive thing to see, and it's in line with the rotation. Uh, this is Mario Kalanovic, who I was talking about. He was out this week saying that the beaten stocks are going to soon make a huge comeback. And it's a two-pronged thesis. Uh, he's talking about uh, energy and financials, as we've been pounding the table for the last eight weeks. Plus, and um, the two catalysts, one will be the introduction of the coronavirus vaccine, which we'll see in November with Pfizer will introduce their vaccine for emergency approval. And the other catalyst will be the reopening of the economy. And this will this will occur after the U.S. election, quote, no matter who is president. You got to keep in mind, two of the biggest economies are basically still mostly shut down, California and New York uh, and, you know, Illinois, Michigan and different areas like that. So that's going to add a tremendous amount of demand and um, and growth to the economy. And that's that's a good thing. Uh, Carlton English was out with another great bank article this week talking about three unloved bank stocks that may be worth buying. She covered Morgan Stanley, uh, JP Morgan, and Wells Fargo. Uh, JP Morgan Chase takes on Square and PayPal with smartphone card reader, faster deposits for merchants. So I said this a number of months ago. I said, do you think the big banks are going to just sit back and let fintech intermediate them? And the answer is no. They have the resources, they have the skills, and now they're just coming on hard. They're going to undercut the PayPal's and the squares of the world uh, with their, in the case of JP Morgan, it's their quick accept card reader. And in the case of Wells Fargo with Charlie Scharf, he's from the credit card business. Uh, that's what he knows better than anyone else. And that's going to be a monster for, for the big banks who are going to start to fight back. So good thing to see. Um, other things related to the election, uh, there were some key points out with regard to voter registration. So if you're trying to handicap what's going to happen 
on the third think again because no one knows is the answer to that question but when you look at Pennsylvania and Florida registration and um, North Carolina and Arizona in particular uh, what's happened this year the last couple of years relative to 2016 and certainly Pennsylvania was a narrowly won state which is critical for the uh, electoral votes uh, the Republican registration, the Democrat de uh, registrations have declined over Republican registrations growth during the period which there's a high correlation to the vote uh, and in Florida as well. So you can look at this article uh, on Fox News from Tom Del Beccaro, uh, Trump surprise victory is in the offing. Okay, it's Fox News. They're obviously you know pushing pushing that story, which which makes sense. But it's the data. But but what really stood out was um, Marco Kalanovic was out saying the exact same thing, uh, looking at the data, the Democrat versus Republican voter registrations. The Republicans have really outperformed in these swing states. Uh, since 2016 and, and he correlates the narrow wins to the level of registrations which is a predictor uh, and if his hypothesis is accurate the voter registrations in those swing states favors uh, the uh, a potential Republican victory in those states so it could be uh, less it could look a lot different than the polls as we start to get the results back on November 3rd. We don't know. I mean, from from a stock market standpoint, the only thing that really matters is that you you don't get a, a blue sweep because the blue sweep would increase the corporate tax rate from 21 to 28 percent. That reduces uh, S&P earnings by about $20 in the S&P 500, which means you know the stock market will be derated to match earnings in the short term. The bull thesis is that um, globalism will come back and that um, there will be a huge infrastructure package. But I don't see them doing a $2 trillion COVID package and then doing a $2 trillion infrastructure package because at some point the bond market is just going to like not accept it. So um, I think the thesis that what is lost in earnings from the increased taxes will be made up by an infrastructure package if it's a blue sweep. Uh, at the best case scenario, that would kick in and, and start to materialize two to four years out after you take the short term hit. Um, so whether you're Democrat or Republican, what you want to hope for the outcome of November 3rd is gridlock. No, no one party wins the executive, the Senate and the House. And so long as that, that is the outcome, irrespective of who is elected president, that will be very bullish for the stock market because the corporate tax rate will remain the same. Um, okay, uh, yeah, Rosenberg was out saying the same thing, and his point was, David Rosenberg said, uh, ah, okay, oh, okay, right now the GOP holds six of the eight toss-ups, and incumbency gives it the advantage, it demonstrates that expectations for a blue wave, wave may be a little stretched, Rosenberg said. We'll see. Yeah, there is an incumbent uh, advantage and no one's really talking about that. Uh, so that could be a possibility. Again, you're just hoping for gridlock, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. Back to the um, buyback authorizations. Like I said, it's at its lowest level since the beginning of the last two cycles, which were 2003 and 2009. Uh, buyback authorizations have declined 66% year on year as of October 10th. And that's usually leads to the beginning of a cycle. Buybacks will come back um, and uh, and things will get back to normal. U.S. businesses expand in October at the fastest pace in 20 months. Market data shows. So that was nice to see. Um, then uh, a lot of unusual activity in financials and <coughs> in energy. So they're trying to get ahead of this in Occidental Petroleum. That was a huge print, 20,000 contracts. Marathon, 20,000 contracts. Um, Citigroup, um, there was a buy. Uh, okay, now sector earnings, we do these each, 
every so often. Tech 2020 estimates, sector estimates for the top 30 stocks were up one point. Uh, I'm sorry, 64 basis points in the last 60 days. 2021 estimates are up 1.12%. Healthcare uh, earnings up. For 2020, 43 basis points in the last 60 days, 30 basis points for next year in the same period. That's interesting because they're going to grow. You know, you're seeing them pretty flat. They're going to grow slower than the S&P next year, whereas, you know, energy, financials, industrials, materials off a of low basis are going to grow faster than the S&P 500, which is why we're positioning there. Communication services, same thing, 55 basis points and 49 basis points. And then the economic data this week, there was a lot of good stuff out. Rig count actually ticked up, uh, uh, let's see, ticked up a little bit. Six rigs on the oil rig count and five rigs on the total rig count. Services PMI we saw beat expectations 56 versus 54.6. So that was good to see. Manufacturing was up from the last print, uh, 10 bips lower than expectations. That's basically flat. And then the most important number, which we always talk about, continuing claims continues to drop. But also this year and uh, this week, initial jobless claims dropped. So the expectations for initial jobless claims was 860,000. It came in at 787. That's bullish. And continuing was expected to be 9.5 million. It came in at 8.3 million, much better than expected. Existing home sales blew the doors off. Uh, last print was 5.98 million. This print was 6.54 million ahead of 6.3 million expectations. Existing home sales up 9.4%. And there was a draw in, uh, in uh, a lowering in natural gas storage. We've seen natural gas spot go from about 180 in August to close to three bucks. So that's uh, probably uh, indicative of things to come. As you've seen the you know, rig counts, total rig counts down, you know, from 1,400 in December of 2014 to 200 and change now. Um, it, it's it's affecting, going to affect oil prices and it's going to affect gas uh, prices too. Um, but no one believes that yet. They, they will. Like I, like I continue to say every week, we'll wake up one morning, WTI is going to be over 60. People are going to say, what what happened? It was just at negative 40 in, in the spring. Um we had another draw this week. You know, we put out the Rystead data at the end of June. I said we're going to be having draws every single week from this point forward when we had had surpluses for the previous two months in May and June. And sure enough, that's been the case pretty much every single week. Last week, we had a modest build, but uh, we had a million draw this week. And that's going to continue. And Russia's committed to it. Saudi's committed to it. And they'll punish the, the uh, parts of OPEC plus that are not cooperating. Um, and um, and they'll get them in line, which they've continued to do. Uh, building permits were up. Housing starts were up off the last print, a little less than expectations. Housing market index, uh, ha housing building sentiment blew the doors off uh, 95, and AHB housing market index was at uh, 85 relative to 83 expectations. And, uh, you know, some strong numbers out of China, which they've been about two years ahead of it two months ahead of us um industrial production was up retail sales were up the retail sales is a big deal because uh their previous print was the first time they went positive this week they blew the doors off it went from 1.8 expectations to 3.3 percent print remember they've been negative every single print since covid started the last print was the first one positive and now it's just crushing expectations so and that's why you saw hfir out with the bullish uh expectations on china buying for energy uh and that's a good thing it's a good thing for the phase one deal as well along with the soybeans and corn buys from the u.s farmers energy was another component and now that that demand is kicking in and they're they're starting to live up to those expectations so um overall a great week things are now clicking in the right direction it should be an interesting uh, eight, 11 days until the election. Hang tight and we'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Thanks for listening in.